Let's go ahead and call this meeting to order the Pompano Beach City Commission meeting of June 13th, 2023. Welcome, everyone. If I could ask everyone to please, before we get started, go ahead and silence your cell phones, put them on vibrate. That way we don't get disrupted during the meeting. I'm checking mine. Yep. Okay, good. Um, that would be ideal. Thank you for doing that. Let's see. Let's go ahead and call the roll. Kervin? Commissioner Eaton? Here. Commissioner Fournier? Here. Commissioner Moss? Here. There she is. <laughs> Commissioner Perkins? Um, Vice Mayor McGee? Here. Mayor Harden? Here. Thank you for that. Our invocation today is going to be given by the Reverend Mark Andrew Jones from St. Nicholas Episcopal Church. That, that'll be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If we can please all rise. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you are the Holy One, known by many names and yet beyond all names. You are known to us in the spirit of community, the spirit of justice, and in the spirit of love. We give you thanks and praise for the wonder and bounty of creation, the breath of life, and the love you have for us. By your grace, help us to have similar compassion for one another. Bless especially the public servants of this commission who have been called to lead the community in which we live, work, and pray. Grant them wisdom, a thirst for justice, and a righteous character to govern for the common good of all with a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times. Strengthen them in their ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement. Sustain them with personal peace in their lives and joy in their tasks. May they and we always be guided by the spirit of community, the spirit of justice, and by the spirit of love. All this we ask in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you. May be seated. All right. That takes us up to approval of minutes. Can I get a motion approving the regular city commission meeting minutes of May the 23rd, 2023? So moved. Second. Moved and second. And all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you for that. On our agenda today, we will be postponing item number three until the June 27th meeting. So item number three will be postponed until June the 27th. Uh, Mr. Harrison, are there any further changes to our agenda? No, sir. Very good. Can I get a motion approving the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Moved and second. And all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Um, on our consent agenda this, this afternoon, um, no items will be pulled. And like I mentioned previously, item number three has been postponed. So all items on the consent agenda, with the exception of item three, are eligible for discussion during audience to be heard. Very good. All right. Uh, that takes us up to proclamations. I've got a proclamation for Alzheimer's and Bra Brain Awareness Month. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Alexander Rousseau Balarte, director of Walk Broward County Walk to End Alzheimer's, and volunteer Michelle Solomon will accept the proclamation on behalf of Alzheimer's Association, Southeast Florida Chapter, right over here at the podium. That's great. Very good. Yes, thank you guys for being here. I love, love the purple. Yes, that's it. Purple is the color. Whereas Alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disease that slowly deteriorates brain cells, affecting one's reasoning skills and abilities to perform simple tasks, ultimately leading to memory loss. And whereas Alzheimer's disease cases in Florida are expected to increase 24% from 580,000 in 2020 to more than 720,000 in 2025. And whereas 806,000 Floridians provided over 1,267,000,000 1, hours of unpaid care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And whereas Alzheimer's disease, which currently has no cure, is the sixth leading cause of death in adults, adults aged 18 or older in the United States. 
And whereas, during the month of June, citizens across Florida take part in the longest day, alls.org slash the longest day, to raise awareness and support research and care for Alzheimer's. And whereas, nearly 50% of individuals with increased memory problems reported they had not discussed their symptoms with a health care provider. Yet early and documented diagnosis when coupled with access to care planning services leads to better outcomes for individuals with Alzheimer's as well as their caregivers. And whereas the City of Pompano Beach recognizes the efforts of, Alz of the Alzheimer's Association to raise funds, provide care and support for those living and caring for someone with Alzheimer's, and to promote awareness to fight Alzheimer's disease and related disorders, thereby improving the quality of human life for those living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. Now, therefore, I, Rex Harden, Mayor of the City of Pompano Beach, Florida, on behalf of the entire City Commission, do hereby proclaim June as Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. And I encourage all residents with Alzheimer's receive early diagnosis and have access to quality, affordable care, and that further research of this disease continues. Done this 13th day of June, 2023, Rex Harden, Mayor. Thank you so much. Would you like to please say a few words? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Allie Russo. I work with the Alzheimer's Association here in the Southeast Florida chapter. Um, I just wanted to come in and bring Michelle Solomon, who's one of our great volunteers. Uh, I just have her share her story real quick with you guys. Uh, but I do want to let you guys know that we do have programs and services um, in the community that we provide. Uh, there are a lot of caregivers that are living amongst us that are family, friends, uh, and we definitely have a lot of support um, and resources that we love to share with them. So here's Michelle. Good afternoon, thank you for giving me your time. My name is Michelle Solomon. I'm a Pompano Beach resident, and I just live down the street. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk today was because my mother was a Pompano Beach resident for 30 years. She loved her city. She loved living on the beach, and she loved um, the, the governance of the city, and she was a real cheerleader for Pompano Beach. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and she passed away in 2019. Um, I was pretty much all by myself in the caregiving, um, taking care of her in her condo on A1A, and didn't know where to turn, and I found the Alzheimer's Association phone number, and I gave, I gave them a call, and they told me what to do, and they were just a, a wonderful, nurturing source of care for me. So I just wanted to share my story. And I'd like you to all join me on the walk. It's at uh, Nova Southeastern University on November 18th, 2023. And um, thank you for your time, and thank you to the mayor and everyone for the lovely proclamation. And we hope to find a cure. takes us up to a special presentation, Broward County Transit Premium Mobility Plan Presentation. Barney McCoy, Assistant General Manager Services and Strategic Planning, Broward County Transit, will give a presentation on the Premium Mobility Plan, which is a vision for transit in Broward County that will define a network of premium and high capacity transit projects. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, fellow commissioners. We provided a presentation uh, via PowerPoint. Do you that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Assistant Manager Donovan is going to get you set up there. Again, good afternoon. My name is Barney McCoy. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Service and Strategic Planning for Broward County Transit. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present before you again this afternoon. And in, in the interest of time, I'll try to get through these slides as quickly as I can. Uh, we met with you earlier this year to give you an introduction to a project that we spent about 18 months developing, Primo. 
Uh, as the transportation surtax passed in November of 2018, the county made a series of commitments as to what they wanted to do, or what we would like to do, rather, in terms of a vision for trans transit across Broward County. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is just give you a plan overview, go through the implementation, talk about the program risks, and a summary next steps. As I mentioned earlier, when the surtax passed, we had a vision for what we wanted to do in terms of mobility. We wanted to provide a premium transit services across the county that were modern, convenient, safe, and reliable. Therefore, we came up with the term PRIMO based on public input for the process. We wanted to make sure that the plan had goals, so what we did was make sure to mirror the map our mobility advancement program for Broward in terms of goals. We wanted to make sure that we could provide implement equitable transit solutions across the county. So regardless of your socioeconomic status or background, that you'd have access to transit services. We want to make sure, okay, thanks, Brian. We want to make sure that we could improve mobility for all. We want to make sure that we provide a safe and sustainable, that it was environmentally friendly. And most important, we want to make sure that the plan provided for economic development as these services were implemented. So what do you gain? At the end of the plan, you have over 200 miles of Premium service, approximately increased ridership by approximately 23 million, will a 100% electrified fleet, will introduce concept known as intelligent transportation systems, which speaks specifically to things like Q-Jump and traffic signal priority. And we want to make sure that as these programs or projects rolled out to the communities, that it blended in in terms of infrastructure with the built environment for the respective municipalities. Right out the gate, we want to make sure that we provide a connectivity between three of the biggest trip generators in the county, that being the airport, seaport, and convention center. It's a known fact in transit that for every billion dollars you invest, you get a return on that investment of approximately 50,000 jobs. So the transportation surtax is projected to bring in about $16 billion over the next 25 plus years. So if you do the math on that, that's a little over 300,000 jobs. Again, these jobs will be construction related, There'll be the plan itself with the dollar spent will be a catalyst for economic development. It'll also be a foundation for transit-oriented development and something we all know is a problem, which is affordable housing here in the county. And again, these dollars will provide an opportunity for the small business community to participate in these funding projects. So methodology. We wanted to make sure that the plan was data-driven. So we started out with what's called an isochrone analysis. And an isochrone analysis is simply a, a fancy way of saying that we looked at every quarter in the county and identify travel times between major trip generators or their destination. We want to make sure that we could also compete for federal funds with these projects. So we ran these data through a stops model, which meets the federal criteria for funding. We also wanted to cost the plan, so we went out and looked at transit systems across the country who've implemented these types of services. And then last but not least, we wanted to make sure we double back with our stakeholders being the community to get their participation and our input on the plan. Phases of project delivery. Right now, we're in the planning phase. I mentioned earlier about the desire to have state and federal participation. In order to do that, we're going to have to enter a specific phase called project development and the NEPA. The project development is a federal specific process, and the NEPA process, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, speaks specific to both federal and state requirements for funding. Once we complete those processes, we move forward to design and then ultimately with construction. What you see here are the four modes of transit, or four modes of premium service that came out of the uh, Primo plan. You've got commuter rail, light rail transit, bus rapid transit, and a concept known as high frequency bus. Each one also shows the concept with what I mentioned in terms of intelligent transportation systems, specifically TSP. It shows whether this service can operate in a shared or mixed use guideway. Shows the frequency of service, and what that is saying is, is simply, if you're standing at any point along the quarter, it tells you how often you can see the bus or train come through. The next speaks specific to capacity, and the last two items speak specific to capital costs and operating costs. What's key to note here is that although commuter rail carries more customers, light rail transit is actually the most expensive. Next slide. So let's talk about the plan. What you see here is the network for Broward County Transit it was, as we envisioned it 25 years when it's completely built out. This includes all levels of service specific to the premium plan that I'm speaking of now. 
It speaks to our local fixed route services. It speaks to community shuttle. It speaks to our express services and our limited stop breeze services. But this is the network as we see it built out. Next slide. What you see here, though, is a specific network that was recommended by Primo. And what that's going to get us is 11 and a half miles of commuter rail, 23.3 miles of light rail transit, 76 miles of a concept known as bus rapid transit, and 100 miles of what we call high frequency bus. What I'll do is talk specifically through a little each one of these, again, in the interest of time. The first implementation out of here would be Broward Commuter Rail South. That gets us 11 and a half miles of commuter rail service on the FEC quarter. It gets us three stations in Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood. Anticipated ridership is 1.2 to 4.8. What's key to note here is your projected opening date is 2027. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there's been, always been a desire to connect the three biggest trip generators. What we've got here is the airport seaport connected. This will be served by the concept known as light rail transit. This gets us three and a half miles of light rail transit. It will be elevated. We have not identified the maintenance stations as a maintenance areas as of yet, but they will be part of the project development environmental process. Again, this gets us about 130 to 650, I'm sorry, 665,000 trips. Again, projected opening date here is actually 2028. As you head north from the convention center, you have additional connectivity that's going to take us into downtown Fort Lauderdale. This gives us three additional miles at grade. There'll be considerations for future west or extension upon this, but this gives us about 1.7 to 2.7 million in ridership. Rejected opening date of 2031. Once we get to downtown Fort Lauderdale, we head west to State Road 7. This gives us four additional miles of light rail transit. Anticipated ridership of one and a half to three and a half million. Projected opening date of 2035. And what's key to note here is that based on the results of the study, there's potential for light rail extensions either west on Sunrise or west on Commercial. That'll be based on future planning studies, but this is just based on preliminary data for what we saw in the plan that that is a possibility for these two specific quarters. Next slide. First bus rapid transit corridor will be on Oakland Park Boulevard. That gets us 15 miles of bus rapid transit. We'll go from seagrass to sawgrass, approximately 16 branded stations. And what we're proposing here with all, as specific to Oakland Park Boulevard, but all bus rapid transit corridors, that we would like to operate in exclusive transit lanes where feasible. Projected ridership is between 2.4 and 3.2 million. Projected opening date here is 2028. Our first north-south corridor will be U.S. 441 State Road 7. The plan showed us that starting a commercial heading south will give us 15 miles of bus rapid transit, approximately 16 branded stations. And what you see here, the potential for the light rail connections, again, on Sunrise and commercial. The green portion to the north, and that goes from commercial up to sound of foot. It's a simply an acknowledgment of what we saw from data from the plan, that there is a need for a higher level of transit services that we currently have on the quarter. It's not yet at a point yet where we trigger the type of dollars needed for either light rail transit or bus rapid transit. Next piece would be on power line. This piece would start at Broward Boulevard and run north to Sample Road. Ten and a half miles of bus rapid transit, approximately 10 branded stations. Again, a desire for exclusive transit lanes where feasible. Anticipated ridership between 1.4 and 2.5 and million. Projected opening date here is 2033. Next north-south corridor is University Drive, and we saw similar data here, recommendations that we did with State Road 7, in that bus rapid transit is proposed to run from Commercial Boulevard south to County Line Road, about 16 miles of bus rapid transit, approximately 16 branded stations. Ridership is between two and three million, and again, a concept here is that we would like to operate in exclusive transit lanes where feasible. If you notice here on the map, though, commercial up to Westview Drive, Again, you've got the high frequency service concept, which is, again, an acknowledgement that there is a need for a higher level of service on the quarter than we currently provide with our local fixed route services. Commercial Boulevard. Now, there's a lot going on here. Again, the plan is, or what's been proposed is to run from seagrass to sawgrass, but it's broken up as to the types of service. From A1A to US1, high frequency service is proposed. You've got the blue piece here, which is between US 1 and State Road 7, which gets us five and a half miles of bus rapid transit, approximately 10 branded station. Again, a desire for exclusive transit lanes where feasible. 
We've got the pink underlay here, which again shows the possible light rail extension out to Sawgrass, or Sunrise rather. Projected ridership is between 600 and 900,000 with a projected opening date of 2036. Sunrise Boulevard, again, this is another east-west corridor where it's proposed to run seagrass or sawgrass. What came out of the study here was actually a recommendation, though, to have bus rapid transit along the entire 14 miles. That 14 miles gives us 12 brands of stations. Again, desire to operate in exclusive transit lanes where feasible. Ridership between 1.7 and 2.6 million with a projected opening date of 2038. So implementation, so how are we going to do this? This is our five-year look ahead. Right now, we're in 2023. And what we plan on doing this year, actually this summer rather, is to complete the PRIMO study. 2024 and 2025, we'll go into what we call pre-launch activities. And that's going to consist of service integration. Uh, we've got a study that's going to start later this summer called a comprehensive operations analysis. And what that's going to do is look at all existing services in BCT's system and make recommendations that these services feed into this proposed network. We're going to procure buses in 24 and 25 so that we can actually start the high frequency service in 2026. I mentioned earlier about the desire for state and federal, partic state and federal participation. We'll complete the NEPA and PD&E processes in 24 and 20 25. We're going to design development in 24 and 25 and then workforce readiness. The county has not undertaken an effort uh, of this magnitude or complexity. So what we're talking about in workforce readiness, we're talking about making sure that we've got the right subject matter expertise on staff. And if we don't have them on staff, to be in a position where we can tap into these services via general engineering consultants or general planning consulting contracts. This slide gives you here a 15-year program implementation. It's vertical, but it speaks to each one of the quarters that I mentioned before. It speaks specifically to the service. It gives you the schedule project duration, it tells the current status of each one of these projects, and what the target revenue service date is. These quarters represent the high frequency service quarters. And again, all of these quarters, they're robust quarters, they carry some of the uh, heaviest ridership in our system, but it's, again, it's just acknowledging the fact that where they sit today, they deserve a higher level of service, but it's not yet at a point where it would trigger a premium investment for light rail transit or bus rapid transit. This slide is meant to show resource loading for the county, and just to show you that 2027 and 2028 will be our busiest years in this surtax, and they will have eight projects in some form of activity. Okay, so how do we get there? We're gonna fully leverage internal and external resources. That goes back to making sure that the workforce is ready. That goes back to making sure we hire the right people, we've got the, got the right consulting, consulting contracts in place. We're gonna look at this, um, Alternative delivery strategies that may be design, bid, design, bid, build, design, bid, operate, maintain, but we're going to have to look at alternative delivery strategies that the county hasn't done in the past. We're going to need to generate fast track procurements in order to move this process forward. Seek and secure alternative funding sources. Again, when the plan was put together, it was put together with an assumption that the state and federal government will participate in funding these projects. And continuous improvement. We think that as we implement each quarter through lessons learned, we'll build up an efficiency so that each subsequent quarter would be a smoother and a shorter timeline for us. Program risks. We wanted to be transparent with the public because what we've heard today from our municipal partners and the public is that the plan is aggressive. And we admit it, it is aggressive, it's very aggressive. But we also want to make sure that you understood the program risk coming in the door. Program risk as it relates to market pricing volatility, as it relates to sourcing products right now. Uh, material equipment availability, consensus building, which is what we're doing right now, engaging with the public. Again, we've got a plan that's data-driven. It makes sense to us as planners, but that's not to say that it necessarily makes sense to the public when you're trying to get their vote implemented. Federal and state reviews. Each one of the federal and state reviews drives their own timeline. It's specific to the environmental process, not only for the federal government, but for the state government as well. We're talking about things like major third-party agreements. We are looking for opportunity for transit-oriented development of those things on each one of these quarters, which means we may have to enter into agreements with private property owners. Regulatory risk. Again, as you start the environmental process, we don't know what's there or what's underground until we actually start the process, but again, it is a part of the process. Funding requirements. State and federal government both have their own specific requirements as it relates to funding. Property availability and right-of-way acquisition. I mentioned earlier about a desire to operate in exclusive transit lanes where feasible. And what that means is that we're going to, sit, going to have to engage each one of the municipalities along these quarters and have conversations about the available right-of-way as to what's, what's available, what's not available. 
workforce readiness and agency organization mature. I spoke with, to that as, as just making sure we're right size and has act, have access to the right resources. Last but not least is the public expectations, making sure that we manage the public's expectations and do what we say we can do, that we don't overcommit ourselves in this process. Next steps. We believe this will be a transformational plan for the county. Uh, some of the projects that I've mentioned today have been on the county since my time in the county. And I got with the county in January of 2009, but some of these projects have actually predate me by 10 to 15 years. But we are in a position right now where we can move forward based on funding and the surtax. But we think when the network is actually laid out and actually integrated, it will be transformation for how folks live in the county. At the end, again, you have over 200 miles of premium service spread out between commuter rail, light rail, bus rapid transit, and high frequency bus. We provide connectivity between the, the biggest and largest trip generators in the county. And again, with a $16 billion investment, you have a huge potential for economic development. Lastly, though, as with the surtax, though, when it was passed, we need support, help, and guidance from our municipal partners. So you saw a lot of pretty slides today. All that comes at a cost. Our planning level estimates for the plan right now put this at $4.4 billion. Again, it is expected that the transportation surtax will participate in this funding in addition to both state and federal. So what's next? We briefed each one of our county commissioners the second and third week of April. We presented this plan as you saw it today before the Transportation Oversight Board end of April. What we did or what we're going through right now is the pre-adoption public outreach. And actually, this item was before our commission, the county commission, this morning for approval. Uh, we have a commission workshop. We had it on May 23rd. And then again, the plan was presented and approved this morning by the county commission. At that point, the presentation is concluded. I'll be happy to field any questions. Very good. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, commission questions, discussion? Vice Mayor, then Commissioner Perkins. Um, I, I brought this up in the MPO meeting because I know a lot of us that represent the northeast section of the county feel pretty left out of this plan. Are you, are, is there any looking to continue to outreach north of Galt Ocean and see what kind of service um, enhancements we can do in the northeast section of the county to link us into this network in the future or further out plans? No, we actually do plan to do that. Again, the comprehensive operations analysis is going to take a look at our existing services and make recommendations to redesign them to make them more efficient. And then based on the meeting that we had with city staff, uh, Mr. Harrison, Mr. Donovan, and um, Mr. Bosworth, they've requested a follow-up meeting with us to discuss some, to discuss some things in the, in the city specific to development. So as we have those discussions, it's possible that this plan could change, but we're looking to put all these things together to build the most robust plan as possible. And as we you know, continue to remind the municipalities, the plan is a living document. What you have right now is an effort that started 18 months ago. And as we presented this plan, you know, we're aware that there have been some cities that have some significant changes in land use policy. So all of that will be reincorporated in this plan as we go into it on a year-by-year -year basis. We just had to draw a, a, um, a, a line in the sand, essentially, to start somewhere. The surtax passed in November of 2018, and we needed to, you know, move past, move past the planning phase to actually start designing and construction to show some movement with the surtax dollars. Well, and that, to answer your question, yes, there will be part of it. Yeah, I, I know a few of the other um, board members at MPO were felt similarly that you know it's kind of a carve out. Um, <clears throat> so I'd also request that, uh, based on the meetings that the community outreach meetings schedule that they had proposed on a different. PowerPoint. If we could have one further north and east, or a couple of them, that would be, I think, be very useful to feeling the temperature of this section of the county and getting their feedback. Because it just seemed that you guys went as far north as Galt Ocean and kind of stopped there. Again, the plan was is, is data driven, Commission. We and we've heard that you know for the northeast portion of the county and truthfully some of the areas of the county west of University on the mm -hmm. southern end. And again, it's not a matter of saying that they were left out, but it's a matter of looking at. We've got a finite number of dollars. And when we started the plan, it'd be ideal if we could build every quarter from, you know, from end to end or from county line to county line. The problem is, is that takes far more than the $16 billion that we've got in the surtax. So we're trying to make sure the investments that we're making right now meet the demand, and then we can backfill with the local service until these other areas grow out, and then take a look at expanding the premium services. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Perkins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there has been a, <clears throat> a request for a bus stop uh, to be placed uh, there at Markham Elementary School on 
uh, Andrews Avenue and Northwest 15th okay. uh, Street. So can you consider putting that in your plan? Yes, ma'am. I think okay. it was a request for the, the parents okay. um, that do not have transportation. Not a problem. So if you can consider that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here and giving this presentation, but it's interesting at, at the timeline. I mean, it's, it was approved by the county commission this morning, did you say? Yes, sir. So in other words, it's, this is kind of like almost an after, afterthought being here? <laughs> no, sir, it's, it's not. Because again, as I said, we, when we presented the plan, this is just a snapshot in time starting 18 months ago. But all the feedback that we're getting from cities, it's being incorporated. You know, as I said, we've got a follow-up meeting with the city staff specific to development that they have here. It's possible that development may mean some things may be accelerated in the plan or some things may be moved around. The things that we are definitive on, though, are the projects that already had some level of pre-design done to them, that being uh, the East Airport Seaport Convention. Those were, that was a project that was already started that predates the transportation surtax plan. There was a study for Oakland Park Boulevard that had started before that, but it, it vetted out based on the results of the study. But those are two projects that will be moving forward because of the fact they had pre, you know, prior studies being done. But everything else, Again, it's a snapshot, and if we meet with the cities and find that there's development that, that necessitates a need or a different direction with the plan, absolutely, that's part of it. What the, what the county commission approved this morning was not locally preferred alternatives. What they approved was the vision and gave us permission to move forward on developing further concepts. Okay. Um, I'll be honest with you here. I, just, I do feel kind of slighted here in Pompano Beach. Um, when I first saw the map, the Primo plan. Um, it, it was actually in an email newsletter that uh, Commissioner Furr put out, and I saw the map that was that was part of this. No, no, no. It was, it was part of an email newsletter that uh, Mayor Fisher actually put out, and the map shows the Broward County com commuter rail south. It's a solid line as it is in your map still. Okay, so that's basically that map shows that's done. Okay, and it didn't show anything north of Fort Lauderdale for any type of commuter rail. Nothing. There was nothing. I sent an email to Mayor Fisher pointing that out to him, that it had been part of our plan in Pompano Beach and other communities along the east, eastern corridor here. For years, this has been in the, in the planning, that there would be additional stations north of Fort Lauderdale. And yet, there was nothing on the Primo map showing anything along the rail line north of Fort Lauderdale. And that's, okay, simple oversight. I'll, I'll, I'll write it off to that. But I pointed out to Mayor Fisher, I'm a little sensitive about that because I'm the mayor of Pompano Beach. And I'm sure that the mayor of Deerfield Beach would also be concerned, as would the mayor of Oakland Park or Wilton Manors. Those folks would probably be a little concerned also, and others. So then email came out from Commissioner Furr. Um, which I also get his. It included a primo map, and guess what? It had been changed to the map that you showed today. Interesting how that happens. But it's still very concerning to me that south of Fort Lauderdale, you have identified Broward County commuter rail south. North of Fort Lauderdale, you have identified proposed future commuter rail north. That's, that really, that's a slap in the face to the, the cities north of Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. that, and I understand, and I'm, 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 you're here, I'm sorry. Not a problem. <laughs> Don't take Not it a problem. personal. Not a Don't problem. take it personal. Not a problem. But you talk about the need, and I understand there is need across this county for transportation elements to be improved. We have been working in the city of Pompano Beach for years on that. But we've also been working in the city of Pompano Beach and other communities along the railroad tracks for years to position ourselves to have a commuter rail station. The econo economic development that, that that breeds is tremendous. So what a slap in the face for the primo plan to come out and show absolutely nothing north of Fort Lauderdale. I understand the county has an issue coming up with a local preferred alternative with Fort Lauderdale. That's not my problem. That's the county's problem. But to show nothing until I send an email, and then all it shows is proposed future. Not even future. It's proposed future. Like, well, yeah, might, might get to it, might not. That is a slap in the face. 
And I'm sorry, sir. You, you happen to be here. No, it's don't take it personal, but it is. I understand exactly what you're saying, Mayor, and we had this discussion with the city manager. The New River Crossing, again, you're correct, that's a problem. And until that problem is addressed or resolved, if, if we put a line on the map that shows commuter rail north, if you're not able to connect the two, and then what you've got are two separate lines that don't really do anything. There's a study that's going on now between Fort Lauderdale, the county, and the MPO, it's studying, the new, studying that, that how they're going to get across the New River, be it tunnel, be it bridge. But that study is supposed to be complete with recommendations in August, and they move forward there. But I understand the frustrations. City Manager Harrison made the same. We understand them clearly. The issue is, is that, again, until we deal with that or identify how you're going to get across, the two pieces working independently, they don't help anyone because it's supposed to be one alignment all along. It's just that it was, you know, just to be frank, based upon the quarter south, you've had the FEC right-of-way and you have the stations identified, plus the fact that it's connecting into Aventura Mall, you could make that, make it make sense. But having a piece that starts in the city of Pont, you know, starts north of the New River, and it just goes up to Pompano and run back and comes back, it's, it's a harder sale. So what we did is took the, again, you know, it's the path of least resistance, you know, because we connect into the Aventura Mall with, city of, with Miami-Dade. It's not to say that the project was not important. It's the fact that until we're able to adequately address or definitively address that, that crossing, it's going to be a problem. And then even to further that point, there's an expectation that the federal government will participate in this plan. And until we're able to defend and say, hey, we've got a plan, federal government, you know, we've got a southern portion, BCR South, we've got a northern portion that goes through these counties, and this is a connectivity. It's a much different conversation with them in terms of funding versus saying, we haven't figured this out yet, but we've got two pieces that they're not really independent, but the way they're going to operate are independent because we can't figure this piece out in the middle. Oh, I appreciate that, but I'll be honest with you. Um, yeah, federal funding does come into play for the commuter rail. I understand that, both south and north. Yes, sir. Um, but you've got a lot of stakeholders involved in this, and for me to sit here and support commuter rail, if it's going to stop at Fort Lauderdale, that's, that's going to be a tough sell for me. And I've got a voice, too, with our state, with our federal, with all kinds of people, as does this commission and the, every other commission that is north of Fort Lauderdale. So Let's do it. I understand you can try and sell from Aventura to Fort Lauderdale to the feds, but if you've got opposition from someplace else, it might be a harder sell. I'm just putting that out there. And I understand the Fort Lauderdale crossing is a problem. It's not my problem. Somebody needs to take the ball and say, okay, we're done with this. Here's what we're going to do. Because this has been in the planning stages for decades. Predates me. It predates me. Vice Mayor? The other part of, the other part of that, and I, I know there's all this talk about the New River Crossing and how to make that work. If you have the commuter rail line north, the idea was always to tie into Brightline stations, which then go up to Orlando. It goes beyond Broward County. So to say there's no draw for a train line to the north, I think is, is short-sighted only looking at our own county. I would think that if we have established commuter rail south and north with stations, possibly a north Brightline station, then you, the, the argument to the federal government to try and get the New River Crossing is even stronger because we can show our ridership, we can show development, we show the whole kit and caboodle, not just a small singular county transit system, but a statewide transit system in, in the future. So I think that's, and to, I agree with the mayor that it's, it's frustrating to not even have commitment to this future, this potential future thing, to not even say, especially when the timelines are so big and the, the dollar amount's so high, that it really hinders the ability for the cities along the, along the line to continue their development in support of the oncoming possible future. Understood. Understood. Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Reed, then Commissioner Fournier. It, yes, I, I'm, this is very disappointing, um, and I think very short-sighted. You know, transportation really does need to be holistic. It looks needs to be looked at regional, regionally, and if we're, we're trying to get people off the roads to reduce pollution, be more green, it necessarily, as the vice mayor said and the mayor said, it has to include points to the north. This is not just gonna end in Pompano Beach. I mean, the whole idea is to have a regional transportation system and to not even 
not even propose that or plan for it over improved bus routes, which are all well and good, but to have a commuter rail is going to, it's going to achieve what, what the desired result is. So it is really extremely disappointing, extremely disappointing. I mean, when did we get to find out that we're taken off the, you know, out of the loop and not have any voice in it? So, um, you know, it's just very disappointing and very short-sighted because I don't think you're doing your job if you're not addressing a regional transportation system. You might as well just call it South Broward County and forget about the rest of the county. Very insulting. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Fournier? Yes, I wanted to say the same thing and reiterate what the mayor and everyone else is saying. I kept waiting for you to get to the slide that showed us, and you never did. And that is extremely frustrating. Um, you might as well call this the Hollywood Fort Lauderdale Connects plan. Um, and the thing that is most frustrating to me is the residents of Pompano Beach are also paying for this. We are contributing to this, but we are not seeing a benefit from it. And that doesn't strike me as fair. Um, you, yeah, you mentioned three stations in Fort Lauderdale, two in Hollywood, but you're here in Pompano. So it is extremely frustrating, and I, I'm disappointed to hear that the county commission looked at this today and, and approved it. So I, I hope uh, there's definitely more work to be done here. Thank you. Thank you. Just, to, just to, I'd like to point out also, um, you mentioned Hollywood, and uh, the mayor of Hollywood, Josh Levy, actually he's been um, trying to come up with ideas on how to solve the New River issue with Fort Lauderdale. He's, he's aware, he's cognizant of the problems that a southern commuter rail would, would, would be for this county. He's aware of it, and he's trying to figure out creative ways to get people across the New River to complete so that we can have the northern section. And for, for the county, the experts, we, we think, to come up with a, a plan that says, well, yeah, sorry, all we can do is the south. Yeah, we won't be able to sell the, the south and then our north. If we can't have the whole thing, we can't, can't do anything north, sorry. That just, that doesn't work. Not in my book, and, you know, and I've, I've been trying to play nice, but I'll tell you what, maybe it is time for the, the northern cities along the FEC corridor to band together. I'm sure, I can pick up the phone and I can call Bill Gans in Deerfield Beach, and I can call Scott Newt, and, you know, I can, I can get people together, and if we need to, Okay, we'll show a unified front for the northern cities who seem to have been forgotten by some of the county agencies. If that's what's necessary, then okay, we, we'll, we'll have at it. I, you know, I, I want to get along with the county, but I tell you, this was really a slap in the face when I first saw it. I mean, it's, and Lamar Fisher, Mayor Fisher, he's the former mayor of Pompano Beach. He and I are very tight, but I'm sure he could tell from my email, the tone of my email, that I was pretty hot when I first saw that map. And it's ridiculous that the county would, would, would treat something that's been in the planning stages for decades like this in such a, a cavalier manner, not even to show it on a map as a plan. Anyway, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's not you personally. What I would suggest you do is there, there is a lot more to this discussion than what I've said today. And I will leave it at that. I, 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 I'm, cer that I'm I certain had. there is, and I have been hearing that for decades as well. Um, but my city manager, he is working right now to get exactly. some folks together who what we can said. have an intelligent conversation exactly. about these types of issues and figure out exactly what it is the city of Pompano Beach and other cities on the northern section of this corridor need to do to get this point across that no, this is, as Commissioner Fournier pointed out, this is our funding that's paying for these plans as well. So I'm not saying that it's, I'm not saying that you spend the money where, it, where the money comes from. I, I'm not a proponent of that. I'm not, not with regular taxes nor, nor surtax funds or anything like that. But I'll tell you what, yeah, I, I feel like we're getting slighted up here. But we'll, we'll have those kind of discussions. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, and especially when two of the, the routes down Oakland and commercial, I know is still in the planning of, you don't know whether or not it's a, a dedicated lane or if you have to raise the, the train line over it or what you got, what's going to happen there. Where this, to do the commuter rail north that everyone had, has been pushing for for years, 
just seems to be the, the more direct way to get some transportation happening, some actual alternative transportation options happening in the county, north, south, and then expand from there. So yeah, just it, it is disappointing. I know lots and lots of conversations are being had in lots and lots and lots of venues, but yes, definitely take our feedback back to them and be like, Pompano's not happy with us. Again, my smile is not contempt, it's not disrespect. I will go on record, Mayor, Vice Mayor Commissioners, as I share with City Manager Harrison, there's a lot more to this discussion at commuter rail than I am at liberty to get into today. I would suggest that you follow up the county administrator. I'll leave it at that, respectfully. Very good, thank you for that. Further commission discussion? Questions, concerns? Um, thank you so much. I do appreciate you being yes, here. And Absolutely. it's like, as I said, please no don't problem. take our comments no personally. It's not, it uh, we're, it's not to the messenger. It is about the message. Understood, sir. Understood. And, and we all have a part to play. And yes, uh, we represent Pompano Beach. Understood. We're, no we're, pretty, we're pretty territorial up here, OK? <laughs> this is no our city, problem, and we man. care deeply about it. It's not understood. Understood. Thank you for your yes. time. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right. Well, that was, that was exciting. Now, let's see what we can follow up. Uh, let's follow up with a presentation of actuarial evaluation report for the city of Pompano Beach. Police and firefighters retirement system will begin, be given by Mr. Lawrence Watts, actuary for the Nyhart Company. Mr. Watts, Mr. Harrison, you're going to lead us up, tee us up? I'll introduce Mr. Mayor. My name's Commissioners and Mr. Harrison. My name is Paul O'Connell. I'm the chairperson for the Pompano Beach Police and Firefighters System. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Deborah, our executive director, and Lawrence Watts, our actuary, who's going to go over some tough numbers. Very good. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I also have a presentation. I don't know if I'm going to be able to navigate it at the same time, but I will try my best. Okay. Uh, it's actually not ours. Okay. So well, that one said Kavanaugh. <laughs> okay, I will do my best to, to do this two-handed. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for having me. Uh, City Commissioners, I'm Lawrence Watts. Uh, most of you know me. Um, as you all know, you are the plan sponsor for the police and fire retirement system that's administered by uh, Debbie and her team. Um, here to talk through the 10-122 actual evaluation results. Um, this is the annual valuation we do to come up with the liabilities for the plan and the recommended contribution that the city is to fund each year. Um, just very quickly to go through the, the results at a high level, we all know that last year was a terrible year in the capital markets. Uh, nowhere to hide fixed income, equities, everything was down. Uh, and, and the plan lost 16.3% of its assets on a, on a market value basis. Um, and that's versus a 7.2% assumption for the prior year. So we're, we're assuming as part of our valuation process that trust is going to earn 7.2%. So if you look at a 16.3% loss, we're really 23.5% behind where we had hoped to be last year. So that's not good. Thank you so much. Um, uh, on, the good, on the good side of things, there is a part of the funding policy that tries to mitigate that volatility that we know is going to happen in the markets. So we're actually smoothing in gains and losses over a five-year period. And so on that smooth basis, it was about a three and a half, a 3.66% return. So in reality, it was only about a 4% loss. But the, the rub there is that the next four years, you're going to be recognizing those losses that have not been recognized yet. So um, some headwinds still to come over the next four years. Uh, the other big thing that happened during the year, as, as you all are likely familiar with, is that there was a substantial um, renegotiation of pension benefits for the firefighters. And in general, um, those were more uh, valuable benefits, so uh, allowing firefighters to retire earlier with a, a slightly larger benefit than they had before based on their years of service. Um, when you add everything together, that in increased costs fairly substantially. So both um, the benefits that had already been accrued in the past for prior service and then forward-looking service for benefits to be earned in the future. We'll, we'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, in terms of what happened during the year, uh, we do a, a liability analysis, what we call a gain-loss analysis, to see how well our assumptions basically projected what were going to happen during the year, and things were pretty good. Um, there were uh, fewer deaths than expected, which typically means that the liabilities are higher, but pay changes were a little bit lower than anticipated. So raises and promotions didn't affect pay as much as we had anticipated. Um, 
we've had a couple of discussions in recent years about the board's policy to lower the discount rate, which is the, the rate at which we assume that the trust assets are going to earn each year and what we discount future payments by. It was 7.5% about three years ago. We're moving towards 7%. So this year we lowered that discount rate 10 basis points from 7.2 down to 7.1. That doesn't help your unfunded liability because it means you need more money today for uh, the future payments. So. All in all, a, a ton of bad news. There's no hiding it. Every single one of those things I said hurts the plan's funding position. So you add it all up, and we see a, a deterioration in the funding status by about 10%. Um, so we're down to uh, about 50% on a smooth actuarial, uh, on a market value basis, I'm sorry. Um, because that unfunded liability is now higher, your, your debt service is higher, right? And we, we call that the amortization of the unfunded liability, which contributes directly to the payment that the city needs to make to satisfy its actuarial obligations. And you see there the bad news, that it's about $20.2 million this year, which is $7.5 million higher than last year. Um, looking ahead, um, we're going to keep monitoring that discount rate. Uh, we have a couple slides later, but we think 7% is a reasonable assumption for now, but there are a number of systems across the state and across the country that have uh, lowered below 7%. Um, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, not to say that the board has any plans right now to continue to lower the discount rate, but it could happen. Uh, we could also go the other direction. Um, we have seen capital market expectations turn around pretty dramatically in the last six months because equity valuations were so low and interest rates have, have rebounded a bit. Um, but just want to keep that on, on your radar. Second thing, um, don't want to get too deep into the technical weeds, but uh, historically the plan paid off unfunded liability or recognized surplus on a 30-year look back, basically, over a 30-year time horizon. And if we think back to 30 years ago, we were in the middle of the tech boom, right? We saw gain after gain after gain because stocks were on a tear. Well, we're 30 years in, and as we, um, as we continue to inch along, um, recognizing over the next few years, those are big actuarial gains that are falling off of this payment schedule, basically. So even if everything goes right, we're going to see contribution pressure for the next five or six years until we hit 30 years from the, the tech wreck in 2000 and 2001. So uh, the city manager and his staff have been briefed on this. We've been having conversations for the last couple of years, but it's still something to keep on our radars. Um, any questions there? I, I promise that was the worst of it. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, here's a, a history of the funded ratio over time, and you see the pretty severe deterioration in 2022. Uh, the red line is a market value basis, so the actual value of the trust, and then the gray line is that smoothed um, actuarial value that's meant to have less volatility from year to year. The only thing I'll say here um, is that in 2010, the assumptions were, I'll say, a little bit more aggressive than they are today. Um, people weren't assumed to live as long. We had a higher discount rate. So it's really not an apples to apples comparison. If you look back to 2010 and say, oh, we were 70% funded back then, we're only 60% funded today. Well, if we had been using the, the new updated assumptions that we're using today back then, it would have been closer to equal. So the city has been doing its job. Um, the, the board has had a good funding policy in place. Uh, we just have had a rough year this year, frankly. Um, Slide five is the contribution requirement broken down between the city contribution, the employee contributions, and the, the state subsidy. So just a reminder for the, the commission, the state uh, subsidizes through chapter 175 and 185 uh, the, the benefits as long as the city is meeting certain minimum thresholds, which they are, and that's coming from insurance premiums. So those are getting refunded to the plan to help offset the city's cost, and that was about $2.6 million uh, projected for this year. Uh, the, Employees put in 1.8 million projected. That's a little bit lower than historical years because now um, a number of firefighters were projected to retire immediately because they could retire at 20 years of service instead of 25. And just because of the timing of when the valuation was done, there weren't replacement firefighters hired yet, right? We, we knew that firefighters were likely to retire immediately, but no new firefighters had been hired to replace the old ones. And then the, the bad news is that big jump in the blue bar, that's the the employer contribution. So the next slide is the same thing, broken down a different way. Um, it shows a $24.2 million total contribution, except it shows which portion of it is debt service. So that's that big gray bar in the middle. Um, that's the amortization of the unfunded liability. Um, new unfunded liabilities paid off over a 20-year period, and you see that that basically increased by 50%, going up from $9.5 million last year to $14.4 million this year. 
The other number that I'd like to draw your attention to is that dark blue section at the bottom. Um, that's the normal cost. Um, it's a technical term, but what that means is it's basically the estimated value of all of your current active firefighters earning one year of service. It's basically, let's pretend there was no unfunded liability, let's pretend there was no debt. How much is it worth the pension just earning one more year of service? And you see that that didn't quite double, but it went from 3.9 million to 6.5 million. And that's a function of how valuable these new benefits are that were negotiated with the last collective bargaining agreement. The other thing I'll point out there, um, just to reiterate, this does not have any new firefighters that might be hired to replace this, this cohort of firefighters who entered the deferred retirement program. So we would anticipate over the next couple of years that in dollar terms that normal cost would actually go up because more active employees would be um, on the census data. Uh, the breakdown of contributions, we show this each year. It's uh, the, the difference between the fire and police sections. Um, you'll notice, unsurprisingly, that most of the, the hit was on the fire side because those were the benefits that were renegotiated. But we did see an increase on the police portion of the liability and, and thus the contributions. That's mostly because we lowered that discount rate down to 7.1%. Um, this is a reminder for the commission just what changed with the ordinance updates from last year, just to hit home why these costs are so much higher. Um, I, I don't want to beat a horse dead, but it is important to understand what is driving these costs. So very quickly, the vesting period, which is how long you have to remain employed before you're guaranteed a, a future pension, was lowered from 10 years to 7 years. The early retirement date, that's um, the earliest normal retirement date, excuse me, that's the date that you can begin getting your monthly benefit without a delay, was lowered to the lower of of uh, 47 with seven years of service or 20 years of service at any age. Um, the multiplier structure was changed to be a flat 4% each year rather than a variable four, then two, then three. And so in effect, what that means is you max out at 80% of your pay after 20 years of service. And that, that's when most people would be anticipated to retire if they work a whole career here. And the biggest change in terms of cost was actually none of those things. It was the cost of living adjustment that was um, uh, altered to be 3%, and it was eligible to be paid earlier than it was before. So um, prior to these ordinance amendments, um, when you entered the DROP, which is the Deferred Retirement Option Program, you wouldn't start getting a cost of living adjustment until after you actually terminated your service with the city, until you actually retired. Well, now the COLA applies after a year in the DROP program. So. Uh, the, one, the one thing that was negotiated to offset some of these costs is that last bullet there, which is the, the premium tax money I referenced earlier. All of the premium tax money that was diverted to share plans for the firefighters in the past was negotiated to go directly towards offsetting, offsetting future city contributions. Um, we'll see a breakdown on the next page of, of how that works in dollar terms. So the top shows how we got from the $12.7 million uh, dollar recommended 12.700 million, sorry, 12.7 million recommended contribution uh, last year up to the $20.2 million contribution this year. Um, the, the key thing I'll point out there is that firefighter plan changes number. Six million dollars of the increase in annual cost is associated with the ordinance changes. So only about one and a half million was from other things like the discount rate change, the bad market environment. They were still bad. I mean, they still increased costs but they were, they were dwarfed by the $6 million increase due to the ordinance changes. Um, and you see a breakdown down there at the bottom of which pieces of the benefit were the most expensive. And again, that COLA, um, with, with the caveat that it depends on the order in which you analyze these things, that COLA is about 75% of the added annual contribution. Last couple slides, we're almost done. This is benchmarking. So this is the rates of return uh, assumed by other similar plans across the state of Florida, public plans like yours. And you see that you at 7.1% this year are right in line. Um, you're targeting 7%, which is by far the most common assumption. But we have seen in the last couple of years far more plans start to assume something lower than 7%. And we see that at the national level too. So that's what the next slide shows. Um, these are the largest public plans across the country. Um, I know there are a lot of bars and it's kind of hard to read, but this year's data is the dark blue. And just notice how over time everything has been shifting left. That they're, they're assuming lower and lower discount rates over time. And in fact, the average compared to 15 years ago is now a, a full 100 basis points lower. 
The average assumption back in 2008 was about 8%. Now it's just under 7%. Finally, uh, demographics of the plan, just to show that nothing substantial changed this year. Um, this is mostly for your reference, but I will say that the last two active fire, uh, last two active police officers who are still in this plan have since applied for retirement, and they are dropping this year. So come next year's valuation, the only actives in the plan will be firefighters. Um, we do have a, a takeaways page here. Uh, most of these things I've said repeatedly, so I don't want to beat a dead horse. Uh, but I, I do want to say that I recommend that the city council and the city manager and staff continue to work with the board. The board seems to be well governed. These are some substantial challenges that have come across as a result of the, the poor market performance and the ordinance changes, just because it's a, I'll say, a paradigm shift. Uh, things are different now than they've been the last 10 or 15 years, and I think it's important to keep that open dialogue. So happy to entertain any questions, but thank you all for having me today. Very good. Thank you for the presentation. Um, commission question, Commissioner Fournier. Thank you for being here. I have a couple questions. Uh, so you're talking a lot about the discount rate and decreasing it, and it looks like we're on that trajectory, and that has been a trend. Is that a bit of a like a lag, though? Because now we're in an increasing interest rate environment, so everyone's been going down. Is there any argument um, for stabilizing it or even a potential increase? I, I think our, our general employees um, Fund. They were here a few weeks ago, and I think they're 25 basis points higher than we are here. So is there any thought to not continuing the, de the, the decrease, but at least holding it steady and see where interest rates go? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. It's a great question. It's something the board has talked about at length. Um, I agree it's lagging partially because it takes time for these sorts of changes to be approved and discussed and for everybody to get comfortable with things, which is why there's a step-down plan to get towards seven to begin with. Um, I, I will say that we don't want to overreact to short-term adjustments in the interest rate environment. And what we see long-term inflation projections, like the 30-year break-even inflation rate, uh, market consistent measures are all still pointing towards two and a quarter percent long-term out to 30 years. And so we think that yes, over the next year or two, that we're still gonna have some inflation numbers that are high, but we don't think fundamentally at a baseline level, things have changed all that much. Where we do think things have changed are the valuations of equities in particular. Things just sold off so much last year that we think that things are going to uh, bounce back. But um, we, we do think that long term that things are going to normalize. We didn't overcorrect to the downside last year either when things were so high before the sell off when some models were saying that an allocation like yours might return less than 5%. We certainly didn't come in recommending a 5% discount rate assumption at that time. Um, we are seeing some forward-looking prognostications that are saying, hey, seven and a half or seven and three quarters might be more accurate based on 10 one But we've had a pretty good six months, eight months to start this year, so we've already gotten some of that back, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, I'm not trying to play both sides of the coin. I'm saying it's a good question. It's always a moving target. But um, I don't think that the board right now has discussed potentially stopping or moving things. I think the plan is still to go to 7%. Okay. And... It looked like we had performance here of about minus 16% market performance. Uh, our, our, I think S&P, so I, I always look at US equities, I think that was about minus 18% over the same time period. So we, you know, I, I wouldn't say we outperformed by much. <laughs> um, we were about in line with if we did, weren't diversified. Have we made any changes? Uh, certainly going back to two weeks when we had the general employees they were only down at about 9% last year, so they outperformed much stronger than this plan. Sure. So I'll first have to give the caveat. I'm not the plan's investment consultant. I understand. There's a separate consultant there. Um, they, they had numerous discussions over the time period, and maybe the chair would like to discuss. Um, I will say that negative 16 is not out of line from what we've seen. Okay. It's uh, maybe slightly below average, but not, like, substantially out of whack. Minus nine is a great performance for a well diversified. Right, it doesn't sound like it would be an outlier, but you're always hoping to outperform. Great question. So our gatekeeper, also known as a consultant, we changed. We hired the city employee, this general employee's consultant, Jeff Swanson. So I think with a different uh, focus, a, bit, a different vision going forward, I think Jeff is the man that's going to lead us going forward. Also, uh, when I came on a, as a trustee in 19, showing my age, 1996, 
Now, we had three money managers. Now we have about 15. So we, the, the large swath of different kinds of investment assets that we have going forward, we think that will help that diversification. A new consultant will help us do, perform better going into the future. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to attend the symposium that you have, and it was impressive. There was an impressive list of fund managers there. So I, I do think it sounds like you're on a, a good trajectory now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Very good. Further com commission questions, comments? Uh, uh, Mr. Watts, I've, uh, Sir. Um, on page 47 of your, uh, of not, not, your, not your thing today, but what we have in the back of page 47, can you explain how you come up with those averages on page 47? Sure. And embarrassingly, my full report is back there. So could you tell me what it is? It's OK. Don't be embarrassed. Thank you. Uh, page 47. Yes, sir. You see so, three, five, 10, 20, 46 year averages. How, how do those average, because I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking because the 1.64%, um, if you just add together the, the last three years and divide by three, it doesn't come out to that. So I'm wondering what, what, how do you come up with those averages? Sure, those are geometric returns. So it would be basically you multiply the three together and then take it to the, the cubed root, the one third power. So. Very good. Okay, I, I figured it was some something you actuarial folks do, yeah. right? Yeah, to make it more difficult for us regular folks. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no, but but it, it should, in all seriousness, it should be pretty close to adding them up and dividing by three. But it wouldn't be. Exactly. A little different. Yeah, it's a little different. Um, now I'm just kind of wondering because okay, so those are the averages. That's the returns um, that have been gained from asset market return over the those years. That's 1.64% for three years. For five years, 3.48%. 10-year average of 5.7%. Um, and, and I'm just, in 20 years, is 6.3%. I'm just wondering, Ed, have you ever, and maybe you have, have you, have you ever actually just taken those returns percentages and compared that to just a straight, say, S&P 500 index? And, and and I'm not trying to insult anybody. This, we're just having a discussion here. But I'm just wondering, with all the asset managers that are involved, with all the boards, board members that are involved, with all of the folks that are all involved in all these kind of decisions, would we be better off just putting all of our money in an index fund and just go? I mean, it's, I'm just wondering. Because, I mean, it's, and we're, we're, taking, we're taking our benchmark rate down. What, I mean, you probably know off the top of your head, what is, well, I'm sure Commissioner Fournier does, what is the, what is the, what is the what is the stock market return historically average? Uh, it, de it depends on the period you're looking, but post World War II, it's been very high. Um, yeah, right. So that's my point. It's been very high, and, I, and we don't want to we don't want to define what very high is, but it's been higher than some of these numbers. So that hence my question: Would we be better off? Um, I, I'm sure we would still have to have you do an actuarial report because that's probably mandated by the state or something like that. But if we got rid of all these investment managers and just put it in an index fund and said, okay, that's what we're going to do. I it looks like we might be doing better off. Uh, You're not going to say that, are you? Well, partially because it's, it's legally not my role. So I'm, I'm supposed to be distinct from the investment consultant. I can't give investment advice, and this borders on it. It's a discussion that many boards have, um, the, the value of active management and whether um, if you um, if you want to have an equity allocation, should you just have something that's strictly passive in an index fund? Um, I, I will say that there is some value to having customization available. Um, if you want to immunize a portion of your portfolio and try to match things to the actual payments that are going to come out, um, it, it can be helpful. Um, but I, I don't want to get myself into Yeah, you're being careful. Okay. I, 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 will, I will say, though, to your first point, Mr. Mayor, that um, just, just remember that those are snapshots, right? And you're looking at a three-year, a five-year, and 10-year where we know that the last year was horrendous. And so if we look at those same numbers three years from now, it, they would probably look very different. And if we pulled up last year's report, those would look pretty good by comparison. So, Absolutely. I understand that. It's just, it, but it, long-term av averages are long-term averages. Um, it, in 20 years, it, it's not going to change much if you take out one particular year. Um, that's, I understand, you're not an investment manager. You can't make those kind of recommendations or anything like that. It's just, just interesting for discussion purposes, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, just food for thought, yeah. 
Very good. Um, anything further from the commission? Anything not? Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. At long last, boy. Should we take? Let's no. We don't. We started. Yeah. Let's. It's, no, let's go. Let's get audience to be heard. Let's move on to audience to be heard. Do we have folks signed up, Mr. Alfred? Yes, we do. We have three speakers. First speaker, John Bonar, followed by David Miller, followed by Jocelyn Jackson. Very good. Just please come forward. Just name an address for the record and limit your remarks to three minutes. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. My name is John Bodner. I live at 521 North Riverside Drive. Uh, a while back, it was in October, I think, uh, not this past October, the October before, there was an article in the um, Pompano Magazine about that they were going to pave North Riverside Drive, put some trees in, put some sidewalks in. And it's supposed to have started in October. It didn't start in October. Now, why not? And what's the future on that paving of that street, which is like a roller coaster? That, that particular project is still, it's moving forward. Um, we've been looking for funding and it's a, a, we've been working through design phase and things of that nature. It is a live project, it is, it's coming forward. If you wanted to get with, uh, let's see, who, who, who can hold up a hand back there? Uh, somebody did, oh, right there in the middle. There's Mr. Danovich, Pull, hold your hand up again, Horatio. That if you can get with him, he will give you an update right now. How's that, all right? All right um, and one more question. Sure. Who controls the speed of the intercoastal, the boats? Is that the commission here? No, that's not us. It's 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 after Florida Wildlife uh, Commission, um, or F, yeah, it's it's above our pay grade. Okay, no, um, I just yeah, it is. Uh, I didn't it's, think it was yours. I was just wondering if somebody could tell me who it is. Yeah, and it's a, it's a long, it's a very involved they're, they're process. Beating up our seawall, something awful, and, and you guys keep saying they got to be higher and and. and but if there is a particular problem, um, we can get our BSO Marine Patrol guys out there to ensure that people are actually obeying the speed limit. There is a speed limit. Yeah, um, but, you know, I, you know, we don't have it. They, they, they do patrol it. Yes, they do. And they okay. do pull people over, but not enough. Not enough. Gotcha. I, I will talk with that gentleman. Uh, please do, sir. Yes, he, he can give you an update on the Riverside Drive project. And we've got BSO is right over there. They heard your comments about, uh, about the waterways also. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next speaker. David Miller. Good afternoon, Commission. David Miller, 2621 Northwest 13th Street. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Commissioner Perkins for reaching out and addressing something that I came up here speaking on a few times. And also your efforts with the gun violence. Uh, just some organizations I'm with know that you're working on that. Um, I want to also say, good job, Mayor. I mean, you putting in work today, I'm going to say that, because um, perfect timing for this transit mobility plan, because I came to the master plan for Pompano, developers, master plan, who have, I don't remember the names of them, but um, yeah, perfect timing for that transit mobility to be addressed while we're going into our master plan. and. Um, I have a couple of words that I want to say that maybe can go into the master plan's thoughts. Um, first would be like mobile businesses, because a lot of my friends have mobile businesses, but they can't partner well and, and just set up shop. Um, marketplace, they already had that in there. Incubator, office space. Um, gigs, we've talked about gigs before. Gig opportunities, um, pop-up shops. In the tourist economy ties into all this, of course, but a new term that I found was the black box. Black box, so that's the term that a lot of people should look up because that'll energize the mm, film and science. So um, also, um, June 1st, I'm in the cultural aspect. Great event at the Baca Center, if the commissioners that didn't attend that, that was pretty awesome. Um, yeah, as the first time of us releasing our uh, artist resident, um, I went to untap directly afterwards, and, uh, and a gentleman came up to me and called me by my first and last name. I thought I thought they had me. I don't know what was going on, but but he was saying, "Yeah, that was a great event," and I was like, "Yeah, he knows me through the cultural sector, so that was good." Um, our food truck frenzy. We had the last one there at the um, Sample McDougal House, and. Um, it was great because I'm gonna tell you, it woke up 
the possibilities of, um, yeah, just the possibilities that can be done on that property. It benefited the museum and the city, in a sense, city function. Um, last thing, the cemetery. I'm not a part of no, I'm not affiliated with none of the boards or none of that stuff going on, but I'm currently trying to build a coalition to go and do a beautification project over there at the cemetery. So uh, that's Westview Community Cemetery. And um, I'm gonna just throw a word out there, water. Just need some water. Um, come to Juneteenth at Apollo Park. That's it, thanks. Thank you, appreciate it, Mr. Miller. Next speaker. Jocelyn Jackson, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank the city for uh, allowing another year for the Kodak Black Day. It was an awesome day. Um, we, got a, we had a little rain, but the rain eventually uh, gone away. It was an awesome event. Um, he given away about 60 uh, mechanical rides like ATVs, uh, go-karts, four-wheelers. He giving it to the kids. And, you know, it was his birthday, but he gave back to the kids. And if you would have saw those kids' faces, they hopped on that, that equipment. They did not want to get off. So, he, you know, they was like, no. They attached to it, so they ended up taking it home, which was awesome. The police did a phenomenal job, as usual, as always. The security was on point. That was an excellent security team. Also, I would like to share what we have a summer jam coming up, First Class Motions. That'll be July the 29th. It's going to be held at the community park. And also, another adventure I done bought myself in is Smoking Vibe Cigar Lounge Trailer. It'll be the first presentation to the city officials. Some of you, I introduce you to the young men who owns the cigar trailer at the um, meet and greet introduction for the uh, master developer presentation. So some of you guys did get a chance to meet them, but they will be participating at the, um, I guess you have an employee, it's employee um, dinner that the city is supposed to be putting together, but they were elected to partake with their trailer. So I wanna say, um, thank you to the city for that. And also, um, I spoke with Sina uh, over at uh, Marquise, Josh, he, he is the manager that's regulating for the Sonata Apartments. They have opened the website up, so that is very good, and they are getting better participation and communication this time around, how they have everything set up. So I advise anyone who's interested in um, being a resident, a tenant at that uh, location, just go to the website, the Sonata website. Okay, that's all I have. Once again, thank you. Go Pompano. Very good, thank you very much. Any further audience to be heard? That concludes audience to be heard, Mayor. Very good, thank you for that, all right. That takes us up to our consent agenda. Can I get a motion approving items one, two, and four through eight? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you for that. That takes care of our consent. All right, that takes us up to our regular agenda. Um, items number nine through 11 are quasi-judicial in nature. Mr. Berman will um, outline, outline, outline the procedures we will be using. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mayor. Anyone who wishes to testify in items 9 through 11 must be sworn in, may be subject to cross-examination by the City Commission or by interested parties. Those individuals who address the City Commission should state their names and whether they have been sworn in. <coughs> city staff will make its presentation first, then the applicant, and then anyone else who wishes to testify. Following the concluding remarks of the applicant, the hearing will terminate and the Commission will make its consideration. All those who wish to testify in items number 9 through 11, please stand at this time. Raise your right hand and the city clerk will swear you in. You solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence or testimony that you're going to give will be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Very good. Item number nine is a second reading of an ordinance. microphone ordinance of the city commission i had it on cough ordinance of the city commission of the city of pompano beach florida abandoning a 10-foot utility easement located on the northeast corner of northwest 9th avenue and northwest 8th street commonly known as 820 northwest 9th avenue providing for severability providing an effective date so moved <laughs> moved and second for discussion good afternoon miss dolan Good afternoon, Mayor, Commission, Jean Dolan, Development Services. This request is for abandonment of a 10-foot wide utility easement remaining within the footprint of a previously ab abandoned cul-de-sac on the property located on the northeast corner of Northwest 9th Avenue and Northwest 8th Street. There are no utilities located within the easement and the PNZ board recommended approval and staff also recommends approval. There have been no changes since first reading. Very good, does the applicant wish to make any presentation? Is the applicant here? Perhaps not. Oh, very good. No, pres no presentation, just questions. Very good. This is a public hearing. Is there any input from the public on this item? Please come forward. Seeing none, public input closed. Commission discussion. Questions? Concerns? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. Commissioner Eaton? Yes. Commissioner Fournier? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Perkins? No. Vice Mayor McGee? Yes. Mayor Harden? Yes. Item number 10 is the first reading of an ordinance. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Pompano Beach, Florida, abandoning a portion of a 10-foot wide utility easement located on the southwest corner of Racetrack Road and the CSX Railroad, commonly known as 777 Isle of Capri Boulevard, providing for severability, providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved and second for discussion. Once again, Ms. Dolan. Thank you, Mayor. Jean Dolan, Development Services. This request is for a 10-foot wide utility easement abandonment within the Live Regional Activity Center. The easement is located on the property uh, address 777, Isle of Capri Boulevard, on the southwest corner of Racetrack Road and CSX Railroad. There are no utilities within the easement. The review standards for approval and abandonment have been met. The Planning and Zoning Board unanimously recommended approval on March 22, 2023, with one condition which has been met, and staff recommends approval. That concludes my presentation, and the applicant is also present if you have any questions. Very good. Does the applicant wish to make any presentation? Questions only. Qu questions only. Very good. Thank you for that. This is a public hearing. Is there any input from the public on this item? Seeing none, public input closed. Commission discussion. Questions, concerns? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. Commissioner Eaton? Yes. Commissioner Fournier? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Perkins? Yes. Vice Chair, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor McGee? Yes. Mayor Harden? Yes. Item number 11 is a resolution. Resolution, the City Commission, the City of Pompano Beach, Florida, approving the Wilfers Platt lying on the north side of McNabb Road, west of the CSX Rail Corridor, providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved and second for discussion. Once again, Ms. Dolan. Thank you, Mayor. Jean Dolan, Development Services. This is the proposed plat for a 1.3-acre property on the north side of McDab Road, west of the CSX Railroad Corridor. The site is vacant and with an industrial land use and zoning. The plat note restricts the property to a maximum of 35,000 square feet of industrial use. A site plan for a 23,000 square foot warehouse has been submitted for DRC review. On October 26, 2022, the Planning and Zoning Board unanimously recommended approval of the plat with two conditions that have been met and staff recommends approval. The applicant is present if you have any questions. Very good. Does the applicant wish to make any presentation? Questions only. Very good. Thank you for that. This is a public hearing. Is there any input from the public on this item? <laughs> Seeing none, public input closed. Commission discussion. Questions? Concerns? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll. <coughs> Commissioner Eaton? Yes. Commissioner Fournier? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Perkins? Yes. Vice Mayor McGee? Yes. Mayor Harden? Yes, that ends our quasi-judicial proceedings. It takes us up to item number 12, is the first reading of an ordinance. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Pompano Beach, Florida, approving and authorizing the proper city officials to execute a service agreement between the City of Pompano Beach and OpenGov, Inc. to provide cloud-based software services providing for severability, providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved and second for discussion. Good afternoon, Ms. Diamante. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Commissioner, Sarita Diamante, Budget Director. This is the first hearing to approve um, our exist or a renewal of the contract with OpenGaving to provide cloud-based services. We're currently utilizing the platform for budgeting and planning and reporting and analytics. This is a five-year contract starting in fiscal year 2024. 
and ending in fiscal year 2028 with a cost of, of over the five years of $726,000 approximately. And uh, this concludes my comments. Very good, thank you for that. This is a public hearing. Is there any input from the public on this item? Seeing, yep, I saw a hand. Don't be shy. That's okay. It's all good. Um, David Miller, Pompano Beach resident. Um, I was looking at it and it said cloud-based software. Now, um, I might be a little sci-fi freak because I watch Batman and all that, but what does that truly mean for a city? Like, it, it just means that you access it via the web. That's what it is. Website that we utilize. It, yeah, yeah, when you that, access, oh, okay, access okay. it via the internet. Oh, okay. I thought that was dealing with security or something like that. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Thank you. Further input from the public. Seeing none. Public input closed. Commission discussion. Questions, concerns. Seeing none. Let's call the roll. Commissioner Eaton. Yes. Commissioner Fournier. Yes. Commissioner Moss. Yes. Commissioner Perkins. Vice Mayor McGee. Yes. Mayor Harden. Yes. Item number 13 is a second reading of an ordinance. An ordinance of the city of Pompano Beach, Florida, approving and authorizing the proper city officials to execute a First Amendment to the service agreement between the city of Pompano Beach and American Legal Publishing Corporation to provide for the reprinting and supplementing of the city of Pompano Beach Code of Ordinances, providing for severability, providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded for discussion. Good. Mr. Alfred. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the second reading of the ordinance, and there has been no changes since the first reading. That concludes my comments. Very good. Thank you for that. This is a public hearing. Is there any input from the public on this item? Seeing none, public input is closed. Commission discussion. Questions, concerns, good thoughts? Okay, let's go ahead and call, call the roll. Commissioner Eaton. Yes. Commissioner Fournier. Yes. Commissioner Moss. Yes. Commissioner Perkins. Vice Mayor McGee. Yes. Mayor Harden. Yes, item number 14 is a resolution. A resolution of the City Commission of the City of Pompano Beach, Florida, appointing blank to the Air Park Advisory Board of the City of Pompano Beach to fill the unexpired term of James Norhead, said term to expire on May 26, 2024, providing an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved and second for discussion. Are there any nominations for this item? Mr. Mayor. Oops, uh, Vice Mayor. I'd like to nominate the incumbent number one, W.P. Davis. W.P. Davis, incumbent number one, been nominated. Very good. Are there any further nominations? Hearing none, nominations closed. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you for that. Wasn't it? All right. That uh, takes us up to audience to be heard. Additional, there is none. There's no additional audience to be heard. Very there. good. Our next scheduled meetings are June the 27th, 2023 at 5 p.m. That is for a city commission budget workshop. So that's June 27th at 5 o'clock. Then followed by June 27th at 6 o'clock, for the regular city commission meeting. So it'll be back-to-back -back meetings. Um, then on June 11, 2023 at 1 p.m. will be a regular city commission meeting. So June 27th and then the 11th of July. Thank you. That takes us up to reports. Mr. Harrison. Yes, sir. Uh, just a few quick things. Uh, the city will be closed Monday, June 19th or Juneteenth. This is uh, just the second year that we's, we have observed this. So. Uh, wanted to make sure everybody remembered that this is a federal holiday and the city observes federal holidays. Um, second thing, on your schedules, June 21st uh, at 10 a.m., we're going to have a ribbon cutting for uh, Commissioner Moss's McNair Park Project. So that's on June 21st at 10 a.m. Um, third on your schedule, uh, we have an active intruder training program <coughs> in City Hall. And uh, this is just mainly to let you know that we will be closed. We will actually close the doors, have everybody inside for the training from 7 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on uh, June 21st, uh, excuse me, 22nd, June 22nd. Um, Russ put these around to each one of you. Uh, Commissioner Eaton's having a cleanup day in Crest Haven on June 15th. So just make sure everybody knows that. And uh, Earl Bosworth had his wrist operated on Monday and isn't here, 
but wish him a happy five-year anniversary with the city of Pompano Beach. All right. Yay. Happy anniversary. He gets a pin now. Yes, sir. <laughs> that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Harrison, um, on the active, active uh, intruder, are you going to have someone stationed outside the doors of City Hall so in case somebody comes up, they don't get concerned about what's going on and you wind bet. up calling the police or something? Just, just a thought. Yes, yeah. Sir. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, takes us up to city attorney, Mr. Berman. Yes, I just want you to know I rejected the idea of using the city attorney for target practice for the live shooter drill. Uh, I really don't want to do that. Actually, so. actually you were going to be the one outside the door. <laughs> I'd prefer that, I think. I have no report. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Takes us up to city clerk, Mr. Alfred. Yes, no report. All right, no report. All right, City Commission, Commissioner Eaton. No report, Mayor, no report. thank you. All right, Commissioner Fournier. I have a couple things. Um, first, you know, going back to what we heard earlier from the county about transit and that we're effectively on our own right now, um, it, it makes me think of Atlantic Boulevard like most things do because it's in uh, the heart of my district. Um, I have been hearing from a lot of residents again about the lack of common sense there. I, I think there's a turn lane that's closed off at Cypress and Atlantic for construction right now. So there's a lot of uh, people sitting through multiple light changes there. Now that is just for construction, but um, I appreciate the city's response with the, the traffic calming efforts that they've done in, especially in Old Pompano. But it does strike me that it's going to be hard to traffic calm our way out of this in Garden Isles and Old Pompano. So I'm just reminding everyone up here that if it was your district that had this traffic problem in it, I would care. And if anyone up here cares at some point to talk about the traffic and the lane that's being taken out of Atlantic Boulevard that is impacting the commute times for the residents of my district, I am here whenever you want to talk about it. Um, and then second, uh, I have been fielding a lot of questions from residents about the timing of the Six Terrace Bridge. I'm sure Mayor Hardin fielded these questions when he was commissioner also. Um, but there was recently a delay uh, announced of about you know, six to nine months. It's to be expected. It's a big project with a redesign. But I just want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to get this bridge started as quickly as possible uh, because I've been hearing a lot of mounting frustration. So if there's anything we can do to do things in parallel to expedite the, the schedule for the Six Terrace Bridge, the residents would really appreciate that. Um, and then last of all, I want to say Happy Father's Day. I think that's happening before our next meeting. So Happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner Moss. I'd like to congratulate the Collier City, Greater Collier City Civic Association for their very successful um, scholarship awards banquet this last Saturday. They were able to give two scholarships of $3,000 each plus a computer to two uh, young men from Blanchili High School. Uh, Commissioner Eaton, thank you very much for being there. It was a big success, and uh, it, uh, congratulations to the group for um, being so co committed to the community and helping young people uh, get to college. And that'll do it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Perkins. Thank you, Mayor. I have three um, items here. Uh, the first one is I um, I uh, have been receiving a lot of complaints regarding the um, the construction going on Northwest 3rd Avenue. And I was wondering, asking the city attorney, if we could possibly put something in place, because I understand that the, the complaints that I'm getting in that area from residents is because of the noise and the drilling in the ground is constant. And I'm told that you can also, the contractors can work until 11 o'clock at night. So it's a real inconvenience for the residents in that area. Um, is there any way that we can discuss that in the ordinance a little bit more? Um, I know that there are deadlines for a lot of these uh, developments and construction sites, but in the residential area, it's a big inconvenience to the residents, and I've been getting complaints weekly ever since they started over there with the noise. Yeah, I'm sorry because you moved away from the microphone, so I, I lost some of that. But my understanding is they're working on something at a, late at night and inter interrupting, uh, interfering with residents' peace and tranquility. Is that what? Yes, happening? they're they're building That's some townhomes there on Northwest Third. 
And the residents have been uh, complaining since they started this project over in that area. Now, I don't think it would matter if it was in an industrial area, but when it's a residential area, is there something we can do? Yeah, there's change? code provisions on when work can be done, and uh, it seems to be after hours. I'll talk to Mario. If you can give me the information on the specific location, okay. talk to Mario, and, and we can look into enforcement of the noise ordinance. Okay, sounds good. Thank All you. right, thank you. Um, the other item I want to discuss was the... Um, Harold Abel Street. I've been getting a lot of um, calls regarding that as to why the sign has not been put up. Um, I received an email um, stating that the $500 was given a return back to the family and that there were some issues with installing the signs uh, because of City Vista didn't sign off and White and Turner knows nothing about this. So. Is there anybody, staff, can explain that to me better so that the public can understand it as well? Anyone? Is Rod there? Rod? Yeah, the Harold Abel, he had um, been living in Pompano for like 70 years, and he worked with the, the Broward County Schools here for like 44 years. He passed away, in, I think, in 2019, and his family wanted that street named after him. Um, and I totally support it, but everybody wants to know why hasn't the sign been placed. So the email I receive is saying that it has not been replaced because Cita Vista didn't sign off on it, number one. And number two, uh, White and Turner engineering consultants uh, submitted or didn't submit documents. So I've never heard of anything like this for a street name in Pompano, so I'm just wondering why did the family um, well, first of all, the, the street name would have to have been approved by this body, and we'll, we'll just have to uh, yeah, get it back was, into it. Well, the thing is, it was approved. It was approved, um, but in this memo, which I sent to you, this email, um, the $500 was returned. Do you have an email? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, please forward the, it to me, and we'll see what we can pick. Okay, I think out. it's from Rod. Um, let me see the bottom of it. Yeah, it's from Rob. Mm -hmm. okay. You want to share? Want to share it with us? Thank you. It's, uh, New and Trans CRA director. Um, so when when this came through, part of the improvements with City Vista was on Fourth Street or Fourth Avenue. Um, the contractor back then did submit the plans to uh, Broward County. Uh, they were not complete. They required some more. Uh, um, paving markings and signage that has been installed. Um, so it's up to the county to approve the pavement markings and sign off on it. So is this the case with all of the, the namings of the streets or is it because they're construction? All that. So, so they have to approve all the, the markings and the pavements and, and all the signage. Okay, so what do we do in this process because I'm told that the, the $500 was returned back to the family. It was because it was taking so long. So uh, I think in that email, uh, Rob McCann was the one that said that the, uh, the, the check was returned um, until you know we can get further um, clarification from the county is that they get all the information to sign off. Okay. Um, we will get with the family and uh, explain what will need to occur uh, at the appropriate time. Okay, the because said they submitted all the information requested. It's up to the county to approve all that and certify it and, and approve them. Okay, because this has not happened before with any of the other names. I just don't know why it's this particular location. But anyway, keep me posted. The community is very concerned about it. I know he's given a lot back to this community, and a lot of us would love to see his his name there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the last item I have is the um, the railroad track on Dixie Highway. We've been having a lot of um, accidents there. And I'd like for the city manager to look into um, the grants that are available. Uh, Congressman Sheila McCormick um, have a grant for Broward County for the train vehicle collisions and the rail, rate, uh, well, rail crossings. 
and I want to know if the city manager can look into that to see how we can better improve Dixie Highway as far as making it safe for the railroad track. So there's a grant for Broward County for 15.4 million, and it's designed strictly for Broward County, and it's for the, the rail crossings. So if you could look into that uh, from Congressman Sheila McCormick's office. And that's it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Vice Mayor. Um, yes, no, actually, uh, Commissioner, uh, at MPO, they did the presentation from Congresswoman Sheila McCormick-Smith and Congresswoman uh, Debbie Mosterman Stoltz and Congressman Jared Moskowitz presenting that, and a lot of it's going to be going towards with the safety in uh, Pompano is to reinforce the crossings themselves so you can't go around the rail arms, mm -hmm. and then also to continue the fencing similar to Deerfield to make it where you can't just, where pedest to limit pedestrian crossing. So yeah, no, it's very exciting mm -hmm. that we were able to get such large amounts of grants yeah, to really push railroad safety, and um, they also kicked off their event to, you know, just don't risk it. Wait for the railroad to cross. The train goes so much faster than you think it is. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting, and um, I think it ties in. I was really, I'm very excited to hear the rest of the commission, because obviously with sunshine parameters, we don't get to chat, but to hear everyone on the same page to really push for transportation options in the North Broward, in Pompano. Um, a little offended about the idea that none of us, any of us don't care about Atlantic and Dixie, since we obviously all care very, very much, mm -hmm. and we'll continue to work and fight and try and change the plans to make sure that all of Broward is covered by the surtax money. Um, other than that, I want to thank everyone who took part in the Memorial Day um, Remembrance Celebration over at Pompano Beach Cemetery. It was lovely as always, um, between the color guard, the uh, dove release and the parade, everything was very lovely. And then also a thank you to the Girl Scout troop who yesterday, uh, the mayor joined me down on the beach. They took their project initiative to build from the cart, the wood, what are the crates? Pallets. Uh, pallets <laughs> that bring um, the cookies and they took those, recycled them, built them into a toy box. So when you visit the beach over by the pavilion near um, Lifeguard Stand 4, you can Take some toys, play with them, put them back, or if you just happen to find toys on the beach, add them to the box for future usage. And it was just lovely. The girls built the box themselves. They painted it. It was just, it was great. So that's it. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Vice. Um, yeah, just, I've just got a couple of things. And one, I, I want to piggyback on the, uh, what Commissioner Perkins brought up about the, about the grants. Yeah, that's the, the 15, because that was, that was just a, awarded to the MPO. It was already awarded. It's not like something we can go out and apply for. It was awarded to the MPO um, for a rail crossing. So that's, that's done. Um, now, the, the portion about our, our fencing, that is yet to be, I mean, we, got, we got some funding for that previously, but we are still working with our federal partners, including uh, Sherfless McCormick, um, about that fencing to try and get additional dollars from the federal government to help uh, offset the cost of that fencing, which will help with the pedestrian component of the railroad tracks and keep people from getting in there between the crossings. But the 15.5 that you mentioned, Commissioner Perkins, that is specifically for the grade crossings themselves. So we're, we're taking it kind of a one-two punch, so to speak, to try and beef up security with the, uh, with the train tracks because, yeah, we, we all know it's a problem with the Bright Line trains and, and everything else. We're, we've got too many, too many accidents out there. And, and, and on top of which, the federal government the Federal Railroad Administration has threatened to take away our quiet zones unless we can improve the rail safety along the corridor. And so that, that of course, impacts our economic development opportunities. So yes, there's, there's a lot of eyes that are focused on, on the rail safety right now. So yeah, great, good, good point there. Um, also, yes, thank you. Thank you to the uh, Parks and Rec staff and, and Terrence over at the cemetery. Our Memorial Day celebration was fantastic. Um, you know off the top. It, it keeps getting better every year, and, uh, and it was great to see such a large crowd out there, larger than, uh, than I've seen for a couple of years now, and it's, it's gratifying, and plus that we had a lot of, a lot of uh, kids out there, which was fantastic to see that. Also, I just want to remind everyone we got the 22nd Annual Blues and Sweet Potato Pie Festival coming up on June 17th from noon to 5, and that is a Juneteenth celebration put on by the Friends of the Northwest Library. Of course, it's fully supported by the city of Pompano Beach. We supply the stage and a lot of stuff out there. So out there at Apollo Park on, on June 17th, that's Saturday from 12 to 5. Um, that's uh, part of the June, Juneteenth celebration. I know Ty and, uh, and his folks, they've got a bunch of other cultural events that are taking place throughout the month also 
in celebration of Juneteenth. Um, let's see, put up, put up, what else? Of course, the, the Girl Scouts, that was a great time, and that was, that was just last night, being out there to help with the Girl Scouts doing, in fact, did you mention the Girl Scout project that we were at, um, where they did this little toy box out of the pallets, um, it's kind of a recycle, reuse uh, place for, for toys. But they had, they're actually, that troop is actually from Hollywood. Um, that's where this Girl Scout troop is from. And they had approached Hollywood and they had approached Dania Beach. And those communities told them no. City of Pompano Beach is the one that said, yeah, we can do this. And we did. And uh, hats off to Russ Ketchum and his folks and, and Public, Public Works. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's the attitude that we've got. A lot of communities look at things and they say, well, why? In Pompano Beach, I think we look at things and we say, well, why not? And that's really, I mean, that's, in essence, that's what happened with this Girl Scout project. And I was, I was very proud to hear that these other communities had said, well, why? And we said, why not? And move forward with it. So hats off, Mr. Harrison, to your staff for, for making, doing good so to speak, yes. Uh, final issue I want to bring up is, I'll, I'll turn this over to BSO. I received a, an email from, uh, from someone concerned about crime over, over on Southeast 5th Street. It's uh, 22, 2220 Southeast 5th Street. Um, and they sent me an email about crime and they said there was some petition that they had given to BSO. Well, it turns out they hadn't given a petition to BSO, but they had gotten a petition signed by some neighbors concerned about crime in the neighborhood. It sounds like they had pulling door handles and things like that. So I'm going to turn this over to BSO. I know they're, they're, they know about it, but they, we were wondering, well, who, who got the petition? Well, they actually mailed it to me, finally, and got it at City Hall. So I'll get this, that, that to them. And I want to let you know also, Vice Mayor, because that's in your, your neck of the woods, 2220 Southeast 5th Street, Mr. Uh, Mr. Susie. So I'll, I'll see that you get a copy also. But just want to let them know that we got their petition, and I'll forward that on. And happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Mr. Mayor, yep. if yes. I may, I, would, uh, I was remiss in not mentioning something during my reports, sure. may I? Of course. Um, um, recently, Palmier's oldest living resident, Mr. Joel Goldberg, uh, passed away just a few weeks shy of his 106th birthday. Wow. Joe was a very interesting man. He was from New York City. Uh, started out as a young man in what was then known as the rag business, making clothes. Uh, he eventually grew a company that became quite large that was in the ladies' foundation garments business. And uh, he was very successful, but uh, I'll always remember that even into his early 100s, he would talk about how sad he was to having to turn the business over as to a kids, his kids, but in spite of the fact that even he was in his hundreds, he always wanted to keep his hand in the business. So I will leave you with that thought. <laughs> Very good. Rest in peace, Joe Goldberg. Thank you, Commissioner Moss, for that. And that does, that, that, that does remind me also, um, on another sad note, um, former, former city commissioner and, um, and, and fire, uh, involved fire department, former state representative, Bob Shelley passed away recently, and it's um, just keep him in your prayers, his family. Um, he, was, uh, he was a public servant that, uh, for many years and did a lot, of work, a lot of good work for the city of Pompano Beach and the residents in this area. Um, with that, nothing further. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.